Hi, I'm Matt Swartz, and I'd like to welcome you to Greenville Wood Products. We're a custom wood shop in western Pennsylvania, located about an hour north of Pittsburgh. Uh, to give you a brief history of the company, the company was originally started in 1971 by my father and two other gentlemen. My father is to the left here is Vern, and beside him is Doc Sankey. Uh, the third partner has since passed away, George Lukeric. Uh, I actually have a photo of my dad and George back when the business was first getting started. Uh, he he kind of makes a little joke when he shows this photo to people. It's It's not the first staircase they built, but the first time they could afford a camera to take a picture of a staircase. Uh, to give you a, a brief history for me, I've been here about 15 years, uh, being partners with my dad for about five. And I just got to tell you, I really consider it an honor and a blessing to be a part of something that my dad worked so hard to create. Uh, to give you an idea of what we do, we work on an array of different things. We'll work on libraries and circular staircases and kitchens and baths. And we'll, you know, we'll do historical restoration projects. And you know, right now, we just got in a a nice church pulpit that needs widened out to to accept more people at it but you know we'll, we'll tour the shop and we'll take a look at this stuff and we'll kind of break some of these things down and give you some details as to how they're done and some of the thought process that goes into these things so maybe we'll go ahead and start the tour now and start by looking at some of the wood I'd like to give you a little bit of a feel for how we get our lumber from the from a rough product into the shop here to where we can actually use it to build something for someone. We have two examples here uh, of jobs that are coming up uh, in the following weeks here. Uh, one of them is going to be used out of this pile of material here. This pile of material is oak, but it's a little unusual. It's a curly oak. We, we love to look for special and wild greens. I, I'd like to give you a feel for, for what that might look like. Uh, this particular piece is quarter sawed, which shows the curl better, but I'm going to dump a little bit of stain on that for you and just show you how this would come to life uh, in a finished product. Uh, be a very unusual. This is going to be in a cellar. It's going to, yeah, the guy's calling it his uh, man cave, and he's building a bar and raised panel wainscoting and a, a coffered ceiling and a whole bunch of things throughout the thing. But we do that with many types of wood. This board behind us is actually different. That's sycamore. Sycamore is not really considered a very nice wood, but if you would quarter saw it, you would start to get some crazy looking flakes and things on the surface also. It gets a wave and it gets a little thing. It's just very unusual. You might, we just recently did a kitchen where we did all the panels in quarter sawed sycamore and all the frames in a, in a curly cherry and it just makes a nice combination it's something we're always looking for that thing that's unusual or different from what the average person has this pile of wood over here is kind of unique in the fact that these trees were grown on the property of the homeowner and he needed to take them down and he and he, he said he would love to have something built out of the trees that came off of his own property so we love doing this type of thing uh, we have the ability to cut the trees, we, we hauled them to a sawmill, we had them sawed, we have the facilities to dry them, and uh, we suggested that being as he had more lumber than he really needed, that maybe he could waste some of it and quarter saw it. Uh, and uh, uh, many people were aware of uh, the difference you get when you quarter saw something. Normally the annual rings are going across the board, when you quarter saw it they're going ver vertically, but you cut across the medullary ray and it makes it into a flake and you, I'm sure you'll recognize this on, as things of old pieces of oak furniture you used to see as you see that flake kind of come to life on the surface it's just a little unusual and different but it's got a beauty and a, a patina of its own that's, uh, that just makes the person feel like they're really getting something custom and special so we love doing that type of thing on any number of different types. We're always looking for that odd thing, that different thing, that thing that's really kind of special in grain direction and things. We also salvage quite a bit of lumber. If you look up at the racks in the ceiling here, uh, we recently tore down two barns and an old house that were built in the 1840s uh, out of uh, chestnut. And we did a project, took about 10,000 feet of chestnut, all the floors, six staircases, a bar, a entertainment center, all the doors and wall paneling. But we ended up with four or 5,000 feet left over. And instead of putting it in a kiln, we like to put it up on the racks with a fan and dry it slow in the winter over a period of four or five months. You don't get any tension in it. It's a much better drying process. Uh, 
you don't, when you rip a board, you don't, it doesn't tend to bow and go crooked. It's just a really nice process when you have the time to dry it slow. Another advantage for us is this pays for about half of our heating bill in the winter time because it costs money to dry that lumber, but it doesn't cost us anything just to blow air on it in here. So we got the advantage of saving on the heat bill. Uh, it also acts as a radiator. You put 10,000 board feet of lumber on stickers and heat it to 65 degrees. When we turn our fans on in here to run the machines, it sucks all the air out of the building instantly. But you can't really change the temperature of the building even a degree, because as soon as you shut them back off, there's such a mass heated to 65 degrees that it just radiates right back to the, to the same temperature. So uh, that's uh, been a real advantage for us here in, in the process of drying and getting our lumber prepared and ready to go for production. Uh, this particular room, we kind of consider our inspirational room. You know, we'll, we'll bring clients in and let them look around and see if there's anything that grabs your eye, you know, when you're originally trying to get inside their head and see what they like. You know, maybe you can come in here and, and peek at something. It's either something we've already built or something we've picked up through the years that would like to build someday. Uh, a little mix of both. These particular logs here were, were cut to be corner columns on an island for this kitchen here. The, the kitchen was all live-edged material and really supposed to look natural left all the the sap in on the wood on the panels and and uh, you know we kind of cut down maybe 10 or 15 logs and she came in and picked which picked which ones she liked which ones fit you know like maybe a little limb would stick out and hold up the granite on the overhang for the island in the kitchen yeah, it really turned out as a nice project uh, up here we have Here's a mock-up of a crown mold. Someone just knew they really wanted a heavy crown mold sticking out over it. it had big columns underneath it. Uh, this particular mold has kind of become our signature mold. We try to stick it on where we can when it fits into the project to just kind of let you know it's something that we did. You know, and this whole wall is just full of things that we've gathered through the years or, you know, this particular church pews we remade maybe four or five of those. Uh, here's a foam mock-up. It, it was an all carved table. It was a curly maple table, but he wasn't quite sure he knew what each shape he wanted the leg to be. So we make a foam mock-up and cut it out. And you, you know, you get to kind of pick and say, maybe a little wider here or a little thinner. You just kind of leave it up to the client to decide if, if, if they want to. Uh, over here's a it's an old castle door from Europe. Basically, like I said, room of inspiration. We just kind of picked this piece up to, to have something to look off of. We've actually built this door two or three times now, different sizes, different heights, different widths to fit the space that the particular client needed. But, you know, you, you spot this piece and think, oh, I want something like that. Uh, you never really know what it's going to inspire. This, this actually led to a a wine cellar. Here's a little cabinet door. There's a big octagon bar and all the cabinet doors kind of match this. Then they had a door similar to this style off in the back corner that led down a hallway to their wine cellar. Uh, when you're doing this style of door, we like to offer, you know, you can have it hand scraped. There's a lot of different ways to hand scrape things. Here's a couple different, you know, here's a real deep gouge scrape and here's a scraper plane scrape. Uh, same deal, we'll, we'll let the person come down and pick out what they like and, and we'll go from there. Here's kind of a this particular client has a Tudor house and just, just wanted some heavy gothic jams going into the dining room. Uh, we stuck some cut nails in it and some some architectural details up the inside of the jam that you wouldn't necessarily normally see. This still gets a heavy casing out around the outside. That'll all be installed after it's put in. What we have here is a couple of projects that have come in here just recently we're ready to work on. Uh, this little bundle of thing here is an old, it's a 
pile of old a antique double hung sash. It used to be a huge part of our business back in the 70s, remaking sash. But today, very few people even can tell you the difference between a bottom check rail and a top check rail. But we still, some people still would like to have their windows restored historically, just the way they were in the 1800s. So we still do a fair amount of restoration of sash work. This bigger frame you're looking at here is just the top of a window. The window was 16 feet tall, but you can see they're all in bad shape and rotted out. And we'll take all the dimensions off of these frames. Um, we'll rebuild these frames. We have a couple different stained glass artists that are just excellent uh, craftsmen, and they will remake some of these glass that are damaged and, and um, uh, repair these back to the way they were originally. We also will get a chance to, I think, move into an area where we did some of this work and show you some of the new huge frames and glass that we have done. This particular unit over here is an old pulpit that came out of a church. It's been in several different churches already, but they're building a new church and because of the historical significance of this particular piece, they'd like to reuse it. The problem is, on the back side, it only held about one or two people. And this particular congregation likes to have, especially groups of their younger uh, parishioners, come up and maybe sing or do a little presentation as a group. So at, they ask us to take this when we, when they took this apart, some of it kind of gets into bad shape. It kind of comes apart and falls apart. And so it's our job to widen this thing out. Instead of being 48 inches wide, we want it to be about 80 inches wide. And we'll reconstruct these panels and put them all back together and make this look like it was just grew right where it is. Uh, we'll get a chance to show you some more of our church type furniture and things uh, as we move on today. So here we'll take a, a look at a library piece we just started. It's a 16 foot wall. And uh, to give you an idea of the process, you know, usually we meet with the client and, and try to get an idea of, of what they're wanting for the space, what, what style they have, what they, what they have in mind. Do they like details? Do they like it clean? Do they want it beefy, heavy molds? Or do they want to, you know, you just don't know till you meet with them. Uh, sometimes it goes quick. In this particular job, they knew they wanted three symmetrical openings. They wanted to keep the space pretty symmetrical from left to right, you know. So when we do a drawing, even from left to right, we'll change the drawing just to give them some different ideas. You know, you got just a plain pilaster with maybe a sconce on it or three panels here, or, or maybe the casing will jog around. But, you know, we like to give them some options. And, and in this particular situation, they like the first drawing and we started the project, but, but uh, it doesn't necessarily always go that way. We, here's a bar where we're getting ready to start, and the person just wanted to see some different options as to what could the space look like. It's basically the same size space. It's 16 feet wide as this wall unit we're looking at, but here's some different options and maybe some glass doors on it or arches with some big columns, you know, maybe just arches on one side with a square TV in the center, but you just never know, you know, you just start to fine tune what they like as they see it. So this particular project, we ended up going with it. It's a little bit of an antique feel. We got the drawer fronts coming out over the doors on the bottom, like you might see in some old pieces. And uh, the whole unit actually breaks down into six pieces with, with the upper here being a section and the base here being a section and they all come apart a lot of times these will actually be secret compartments. You know, this could be a door. In this particular pace, uh, case, it's going to be a fixed panel. But we'll do pullouts here a lot of times. We've done pullouts up top where it's actually a gun cabinet and, you know, kind of a little secret space. People will like that. Uh, one of the things we feel like we offer people is the ability to make some decisions themselves. You know, when meeting with them originally, we might encourage them to find some pictures they like or maybe some pieces they've seen in, in, in their friends' houses, or you know, you just never know where you're gonna see something that you like. And then we try to get them over here and show them some of the things that we offer. We actually have uh, a ton of different options for knives. You know, just to give you an example, this countertop isn't finished yet. It'll end up getting a mold applied to it. But you know, you get the, 
you get to come in here and peek at this mold and say, you know, maybe I like that one. Maybe I'd like something a little bigger. Maybe I'd like something a little smaller. I don't know. We just, we just really try to encourage the client to be as, as much a part of the process as possible. You know, a lot of times, you know, I should mention a lot of these jobs are architecturally designed. And in that case, we just basically do what's drawn and, you know, try to meet the specs as, as accurately as possible. This particular cabinet will get glass shelves, but we like to put the shelves, the glass shelves in a wood frame. So when you mount that shelf, you're actually visually, you're looking at a wood shelf, but the glass, the quarter inch glass will sit down here. So when you light the top of it, it shines right down through two or three shelves, however many you might have. And then you don't have to put a puck light under every shelf to get the down lighting in. It gets pretty hot when you put all those lights in. As we mentioned a little earlier over there, we peeked at some of these molds and described some of the options that the clients get. Uh, we hand grind all our knives for the most part. Uh, actually just put a 16th inch wheel on a grinder and grind to whatever size or shape you want. You know, after 40 years, you start to gather a lot of options. So when it comes to things like crown molds and countertop edges, there's just, there's just tons of stuff to pick from. These drawers are just full of, of all the different options there are. Uh, this particular unit is, is being built out of Sapili, which is in the mahogany family. It's an exotic wood. Uh, we like to kind of use a combination of modern technology and, and still try to keep some of the, the old school things like mortise hinges, you know, to get a combination of both. Here's some easy closing drawer guides that, you know, still give you the feel, the inset drawer where it's all flush, but, but you know, and then to, to keep things feeling traditional and quality, we'll use the mortise hinges where you hand chisel your hinges in in, instead of some of the modern things now where the plate would just mount to the door and it would mount to the cabinet. So we try to keep some some quality and, and some old world appeal by doing things like that. Uh, you know, our doors are, are one inch thick typically. We try to beef them up a little. Just feels, feels like you're getting a little more quality when you get that. And, uh, you know, so I mentioned before, this whole unit will break down. We'll put it on the trailer. We'll ship it to the job site, wherever the job site might be. Then it'll be the installer's job to get this thing all pulled back together and tight. Everything pulled back. And then once it's all in place, tight, shimmed and leveled, you know, you put, you put the baseboards on. Whatever the base might be, that's, that's a little heavier than what's going to go on there. But, but uh, you'll fit the base down tight to the floor right it right around and then you'll move up and now there's about a four piece crown mold that goes on this so it'll get a pretty heavy tablature at the top and that'll all be installed tight to the ceiling to just finish off the look I'd like to share with you a little bit about what we do with kitchens uh, in the 41 years we've been in business the type of work we do varies and changes quite a bit for a long time we did very few kitchens what you're looking at here is a basic package of doors for uh, for just that's just what you would consider an average kitchen. Uh, like Matt was talking earlier, most of our doors are all one inch thick. These are drawer fronts here, but uh, we like to upscale a little bit where we can. But this is very basic. If we do a very large project in the kitchen, we may, might even outsource some of this stuff. It allows us to increase our capacity and allows us to save our hours for a really special item. When we do a kitchen, we like to at least add one item that's a little over the top, a little different, custom, something that you can walk into the kitchen and know right away, oh wow, this is, I, I, I kind of like this, you know, and that might be the round of hood and, this, and, the, and the, the cooktop, we might dress that up some in to look more like a mantle or a piece of furniture, or we might do what we did in this little simple kitchen. We added a hutch to the cabinets, uh, using all the same doors, all the same drawers that are uh, in the kitchen, but yet more of a furniture looking piece, not crazy over the top, but 
if you look down at the right side of this, the, the oven unit would sit right here and this panel would come against the oven. But we're going to put a pull out microwave, which is kind of new now, the microwave drawer where you can just reach into. It leaves your countertop space free to, uh, for all the little knickknacks and things you need to put out. Uh, one thing I might tell you and share with you on this cabinet uh, is what we call what we call a layout rod. This is kind of, you don't see this much anymore, but in the old countries they did everything with a layout rod. On this particular stick you're looking at, there's three sides of it got marks all over the place. One of them has every mark that has to do with the height of that cabinet. One of them has everything to do with the depth of that cabinet. One of them has everything to do with the width of that cabinet. For instance, if I was to stand the height stick up on this cabinet, I could look on here and I could see that that mold occurs right there. And I could see that the top of the frame starts here. And I could see that the countertops here and the panels here, I can see where the base is, I can see where the tablature is. I can see everything I need to know about that cabinet. So when I go to build this cabinet with this layout rod, I can take all the dimensions for the doors, for the drawers, for the fronts, for the moldings, and I can give the doors to one man over here, and I can give the drawers to another fellow over there, and I can give the fronts to someone there, and someone else can make the molds. And when we gather this stick and all those parts, we can put that together with a reasonable assurance that it's all going to fit. So it's kind of a, it's on most of what we've, the library we looked at earlier, this, it would all be laid out with this type of a rod layout. Uh, and it also allows us to, if it's a large job that disassembles, these sticks will go to the job and help either our installers or a contractor, if we're working with a contractor, help him put it back together and get all the pieces in the way that we intended for them to be. There's one other thing I'd like to show you about cabinets. Um, and it's over here, if you just follow me. If you really upscale a cabinet, about as high as you can go is what they would call a conchoidal curve cabinet. That sounds a little high tech, but basically what that is, that would be the type of cabinet you would see in the White House if you happen to be watching an interview going on in a White House. They would have a, a shell on the top of their cabinets. And uh, we used to carve these out by hand. And one of my employees told me, he said, you know, you could make a machine that would do that. And I said, no, you couldn't. But typically, as employees uh, always inspire you over the years, I was laying in bed 2 o'clock in the morning and saying to myself, yes, you can, yes, you can, because he planted that seed. So we put our heads together, and we kind of fabricated this little machine, welded this up. And, turn the handle and basically that's, I think I can show you how this works. This holds this large chunk of wood in there. We would put a round bottom bit in and we would swing that down around in there and make a flute. First we would sc scoop most of it out and then it would rotate around and, and we'd do a series of flutes and we'd go right around that and we could make one of these conchoidal curved shells that maybe you would like to have your dining room look like your kitchen. So we could design some cabinets and maybe upscale them and, and it, to make it look obviously like your dining room suit came from the same place your kitchen did. So that's the kind of the little extras we like to add uh, Greenville wood products. This is our spray room where the finished product gets its final touch-ups and uh, finish uh, Final finish. Here we have a little entertainment center that goes in a house. It's got a couple circle top doors. It's got a drawer in it. It's got a lower unit houses, electronics and whatnot. It has a it has our little signature vertical mold between the counter and the base. We use that little vertical line as kind of our signature of things we do. It has an upper unit with a couple fluted pilasters. Nothing really fancy, but just a little unit uh, goes into a customer's house uh, that fills the exact space that he has for it. We also have a couple taller panels in here that go along with the staircase we'll be looking at. This whole foyer is fluted pilasters and baseboards and crowns and chair rails and it, it's a totally wood, uh, wood room with a staircase in it and we'll show you that shortly. Uh, what we'd like to really show you in here is how our spray booth works. Uh, sometimes we need more air intake than we actually have so we use we designed a little thing in a ceiling here that we can pull back 
whatever amount we need to to allow a little extra air to come down. A beveled ceiling allows the air to drop right straight into the spray booth. This here is Neb, uh, our finisher and marketing director, and uh, he's going to give us a little demonstration of uh, exactly uh, how the spray booth works and the lighting. We would normally be using a much more sophisticated piece of equipment uh, and a pump, but with a small item, we still use the spray can. And it, even this, just the spray booth is such a plus for us compared to where we were in 1970 when we sprayed right out in the shop amongst all the dust. We'd come down at night and it just was endless trying to keep things clean. This really works out great, and uh, Neb does a great job for us. Finishing, and like I say, we've moved him into a marketing. He's just—he's uh, a very charismatic man, and he's just got the ability to really let people know who and what we are. So we're really anxious to see him moving into this position. Would like to give you a little idea about uh, what we do in staircases. Here, you're looking at an example uh, of a circular staircase typical type of thing that we might get into. Uh, everyone's seen these staircases standing in a room, but you don't very often get to really get the feel for the helical twist that's in a staircase. So we thought maybe just leaving this lay down, sitting on a cart, it would give you a little better feel for just, just how complicated the curves and everything are on a staircase is. Uh, we also have the rail parts here. Many times you get a price on a staircase and you don't realize it till you have a contract that it didn't include the up easings, it didn't include the turnouts, it didn't include all the extras and special things that go with it to make a staircase a package. The null post. This particular stairs is going to have a square fluted look throughout the whole foyer area. Uh, it'll have a, we do foam mock-ups and I'll just show you a combination. There's the real wood and the foam mock-up. We'll have a railing on there that'll be shaped like this, but it'll turn up and go up the staircase uh, up to the top. One of the hard one one thing that's really important with this type of a staircase is to make sure you can get it in the building. What we did with this stairs is we made a scale model of this staircase, one inch to the foot, and we did a drawing the same, and we built a little room on the drawing the size of the entryway. The entry is seven foot wide and seven foot high. We weren't sure we could get this in the building, so we made this thing and we did the mock-up and we twisted this thing through the opening to see to it, not that it was easy, but that it was possible to actually get this into the room it belonged in. Uh, it's uh, very important to determine that would happen. We recently did a staircase uh, that was a replica of the staircase they talk about in Santa Fe at the Laredo Chapel. No visible means of support. Uh, was designed by an architect, but they asked us to uh, put it into reality, and we did, and, and we had to spin it through a skylight and a roof. We had to twist the staircase through the skylight, making sure that it would clear the fourth floor at the same time it cleared the skylight in order to get it screwed down in its position. So many times we have some geometry to work out before we get ourselves in trouble like the person that built the boat in the basement and couldn't get it out. So it's just kind of part of what we do and what we're responsible for. I'd like to show you the underside of the staircase because not very many people get to see what it takes to support a stairs like this and, and what they might look like. Uh, we generally put a pretty massive rough horse in the center of the staircase and this rough horse supports the weight. The risers and stringers are housed and wedged into the box stringer so that 75 years from now the stairs isn't going to squeak. We add glue blocks to everything we can and glue to make sure that there's no loose places in this staircase so that you can walk up at this staircase in the middle of the night and don't have to listen to it. Uh, the finished stringer here, this one's about 16 inches wide and um, it's mitered to every riser. It's not the type of thing you can do on a machine. There's no miter box you can lay this type of a board down on and start making miters. There's no table saw that this lays down on. So these involve a pretty fair amount of handwork and uh, 
competency with hand saws and hand tools. Uh, so uh, we're very proud of the men we have here that work on these. Uh, uh, we, we think we built a very nice staircase. Uh, this particular thing you're looking at here now sits on the floor. Uh, it serves as two purposes. It, 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 it supports the bottom of the stairs, but the most delicate part of the staircase is right here. There's a lot of twisting and turning to get this stairs into the room it belongs and up into place. Very, very easy to damage and break this piece off. So this kind of hits the floor before that does and helps protect that while we get it up into position for where it belongs. Staircases involve a lot of other things than just the physical staircase itself. Uh, one of the things we like to do is think of different ideas for handrails and balustrades that uh, might give the staircase a little flair, a little personal for the homeowner. This is a particular staircase we're working on where we just the, it, the whole house is done in knotty pine. So we've, we've, we've turned these custom balusters in knotty pine. Uh, very popular a hundred years ago to use a round rail because it was simpler to make. And so we're using a round rail on this staircase. And we added what we call a ram's horn. This ram's horn is kind of whittled out mostly by hand. It would come down over top of an old post and it could sit this way. We have done them where they sit up flat. But uh, just to give you a little idea, I'd like to uh, turn the camera on Don here, who does a lot of our hand carvings. And you can see how he band saws this out in the rough, and then he starts with gouges and chisels and starts to work that particular item down to more where it would look like something like this. Makes very sharp tools and a, and a, and a steady hand. Uh, there's another item that we think is important on a staircase, and that's an old post. Uh, there's only so many options that you can find in a catalog, and we like to come up with some ideas that are different. Uh, we might have something that's tall and thin. We might have something that's so unusual we want to do a mock-up again, like we do with some of our table legs, to see what our proportions look like, get the input of the homeowner to see if we're headed in the right direction or if we're totally crazy. We might even do a new post on a, in a log cabin out of a log or a tree or something just totally crazy and wild looking. What we'd really like to demonstrate for you today, this is a this is a knoll post here, uh, a little different than what you'd find on the average stairs. Uh, and we put a smaller cap on top of it. And uh, we would do a mock up of this too because we like to know is this a little too thick, is it a little too thin? We like to get a feel for did the proportion of the drawing translate into 3D like they, like they thought they did? So this is a finished product of a post like that, the one that we designed for a, for a home that, uh, that, that tied in with the types of things they had in their house. And we'd like to show you a little demonstration of how that might take place, uh, turning, turning from a... Just a tin, yeah. This is this is John. He's he's actually our shop foreman here in charge of keeping things going and rolling and keeping a good eye on quality for us. We can't just do everything anymore. He's become our number one knife grinder. He looks at my knives and he says, Are you gonna use that like that? Uh, you've just got a tremendous eye. This particular talent uh, above and beyond his woodworking is for maintenance. I don't care what we have break down. We got so much machinery in here that's just a, it's vintage machinery. A lot of it's very old, you can't buy parts for. We find absolutely nothing that John can't figure out a way of fixing, get a bearing made or changed or something custom done. And uh, he's also become very proficient with our lathe. So we're, we're very grateful and thankful to have John on board here. Started with us out of the Votech program while he was in high school. Been here about 20 years now. This is the handrail for the staircase we were just looking at. And it needs to follow the same helical twist that the staircase does. And the way we do that is by laying a plan view on the floor and then standing a stud wall up on the radius of the stairs. Then this rail 
is in about 10 pieces in thickness. We shape the inside and the outside. We lay out the pitch that the rail's going to need to be on to match the pitch of the staircase. And we bend these pieces with a, there would be 100 clamps on here if you were in here the day we put this on. And pull this in and hold it in the shape. It needs to sit there about a month till the glue's good and dry. Otherwise, they tend to spring back. The inside and the outside are already shaped, but the top and the bottom need to be shaped. This, this particular reel here, it's got a little upswing on the middle on the top, and that needs to be put on by hand. And uh, John's our expert on stairs and handrails, and so I'd like him to demonstrate for us what we might use and how we might go about getting this rough looking surface to look like it's supposed to. John? You can just tell by the sounds of that plane how sharp it is. That plane needs to be very sharp because every layer in there has a grain direction change. And if you're going to get that smooth, that plane has to be sharp. One of, the, one of the neatest things about this particular plane that's hard to find is this plane adjusts for radius. It could go convex up to about any possible radius we get ourselves into, or it can go concave. It's really an antique. Uh, used to be very hard to find now with the internet and you can search the whole world if you have enough money and you want one or usually you can usually find one that's available. The thing about these planes and, and these young guys that, uh, that come to me, I can, I can take a guy like this with passion, I can teach him how to use that plane. I can teach him how to get a, a chisel sharp as a razor. I can teach him the difference between a good hand saw and a poor hand saw. But I can't teach him to have a passion for this kind of work. He comes that way. I'll give you an example. My son wasn't, took him a while to figure out he, he, he loved this type of work. He actually had a BSN in nursing before he decided he wanted to be here. By the time he got his BSN he found, he was beginning to realize like I did, that this is a lot of fun. Uh, one example, he was the type of guy, young man that would go through a town in a historical district. And when he was leaving town and the traffic cleared, he might pull over the side and grab a pad and he'd sketch something he saw up on a building somewhere. Something that might be significant, that might deal with a job down the road. Here, and he, he started this huge portfolio. I can teach these guys about the saws and the planes, and others, but I can't teach someone to do that. Historically, I've been blessed with a, a lot of unbelievable woodworkers, but they all have that, that one thing that I can't teach them. They, they have that passion that when I leave here at the end of the day, I'm always looking at my clock. I'm looking at my watch. But it's not because I want to get out of here. It's because I wish I had one more hour I could spend here. Everybody has a calling and a place they're supposed to be. And you really know you found it when, you're, when the passion you have when you start your trade is that you still have when you're 65 years old. And, and that's what Greenville Wood Products is all about, helping to take this old world knowledge and bring it into America and keep it alive. We're always looking for ways and ideas to try to do the little bit extra, the little bit something unusual. We try to keep the creative juices flowing. What you're looking at here is Dave, uh, who's working on a stair riser. The, the tread would go in the plow here, and that would be one riser on a staircase. This is going to be the third, third riser up on this particular staircase. And what he's doing is cutting a Roman numeral 2012. Into the, into the riser of the staircase, so when you come in the front door, you'll know exactly what year the house was built. Uh, there are any number of things you might do uh, with this type of an inspiration, but this is one we found that's very popular. Uh, see this just doesn't happen in a minute. It's a, it's a tedious uh, project, uh, requires considerable accuracy and control. 
It's important where your hands are placed and where your elbows are and what supports and keeps that thing from jumping out of your hand to make a cut nice and precise uh, the way you would like it. He does a lot of other things for us. We'll give you an example of a bowl. Uh, we have uh, a lot of vanities today. Uh, uh, let's move on to the bowl. Uh, where they put these bowls up on a vanity. This is one that he's just finished here uh, that might uh, go with this particular. So this is all hand done, as you can see. It's all scalloped and inside and out. Uh, might decorate them up with some carvings. Uh, any number of things. Then let me show you an application. If we just turn around here, uh, this particular vanity, if you would take a look at that, is a vanity that might have a bowl that would look something like that sitting on. There's a granite insert would go in this particular vanity, but that bowl would sit up there and the faucets would come out of the wall through a piece of granite and a frame and down and into a bowl like this. There's any number of uh, things in cabinets and vanities, but we're looking for this little thing extra, this little bit. Uh, uh, typically you wouldn't use a wood bowl for a sink, but typically they don't get used eight hours a day and they hold up just fine. Also, we might uh, get into some officially antique type of work. What you're looking at here is what's called a Chippendale mirror frame. And a Chippendale mirror frame is a little unusual in the fact that on the bottom, the corners are mitered, like a typical picture frame you would buy in a store, and they're splined together to hold the joint tight. But on a Chippendale, the top corners aren't mitered, they're carved. And Dave has one done here. The mold comes up and swings in around and back down. And he has one that's partially done here. That was originally just a square block of wood that was mortised and tenoned into the corner and then hand carved down and around into the type of thing. If you'd show him, Dave, the scrolls and that, that might, they're going to go around that frame to make it look like a Chippendale. Up at the top, there's a frame like that. And, and uh, the rest aren't sawed out yet, but there's a little, there's one at the bottom. There's smaller ones that go on the corners. I think if you're at all familiar with the Chippendale, you'll see exactly how this type of thing's put together. This might be an accent piece that would go with a particular staircase, especially if a person was using their own lumber off their own property. They might want some type of an item, any number of things. This is just an example of what we might do that might be special. We might do you a, 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 a circular bench in front of your staircase if it's circular. We might take the third tread and make it where the staircase flows into a bench. But I guess what I'm trying to convey to you is that we're always looking for that inspiration, that idea, that's something different, something we didn't do last year, something we've never seen before. Uh, keep the flair and the enthusiasm rolling. Like I shared with you, sometimes it's hard to leave this place. We enjoy it so much. In fact, over the years, uh, we probably spend as much of our spare time here as we spend anywhere else. What you're looking at here is uh, our latest hobby. Uh, we like to build guitars. At one time it was muzzle loaders and any other number of different things, but we've kind of got a passion here. Uh, just personally, actually myself, I, I wanted to build guitars when I started the trade. Uh, Gibson went bankrupt and that wasn't able to happen, but when Matty built me a dulcimer for Christmas, it blew me away. He said what I really wanted to do was build you a guitar, but didn't know how. He just kind of set me on fire. And so I said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't we buy all the books and the materials and we'll study up on it and we'll do it together. And so we spent about 400 hours together that year down here in our spare time. Uh, this is the guitar that Matty built that year right here. Uh, it's all uh, curly mahogany. It's got curly maple bindings and a curly maple headstock with little wooden tuners and just, just a really neat little project as a beginning instrument. Since then, we've done a lot of others. Uh, this is one of the easier to do. Uh, there's some in progress here. This guitar here, I'm building for my granddaughter. She decides she wants to play guitar, and I said, well, you're going to have yourself a Swartz guitar, guaranteed. So we got started on that. Uh, the insides, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with a little bit with what guitars are like, but they're a little intricate. Uh, there's a lot to learn. You don't learn it all the first time you build one. This particular guitar here I'm doing for myself, it's a seven string. I'm 
doing it because I can't buy one, and I do some meditation things in the evenings and that with open tunings, and I just want an extra bass string. So I'm doing that while I'm doing the Scotter one. I'm doing a little bass guitar there. I started that, just haven't had time to work on. But once you develop a few skills and techniques as to how instruments are actually made, really the hardest thing to do in guitars is to build the arch top guitar. Here's Maddie's arch top. These are carved on the inside now like a violin to within about five thousandths in tolerance. And then there's a recurve down at the edge. And the only thing that the, the strings make the front vibrate, but the only thing that makes the back, back vibrate is the air moving from the sounds that the front's making. So you, this little recurve, you keep freehanding, scraping it thinner and thinner and tapping it and listening to it till it gets a vibration, till it gets a it's called tap tuning. It's not the type of thing that I'll tell you I'm very good at because I've only done four of these. It's the type of thing that would, it, it, that would be proficient, like the man Benedetto who did the drawing that we studied and learned off of. I can do make it look just like his. I really can't make it sound like his, but I can understand and appreciate what he does and, and, and how he gets to the proficiency he is. We gingerbread some of these up. If you walk around the table, I'll, uh, I'll kind of show you our our new headstock. Uh, this is a little mandolin. Uh, this is an arch top um, uh, out of curly maple and, and spruce. This particular tree I sawed down in 1981. It's really the only hard maple, nice curly, I've ever run onto in my life. I got a, about 500 feet out of it and I'm down to about the end of it, but I've managed to build kitchens and muzzle loaders and guitars. I've just built a ton of things out of that particular log. I'm sorry to see it coming to an end. Uh, we put a few jewels on the headstock. Um, recognize that we're a very blessed people. Um, our little insignia is the cross with the Swartz name. Uh, we've done some electrics which aren't near as hard to do. This is kind of a, a replica of the old 57 Les Paul. Uh, very heavy guitar around your neck. but. Uh, all part of history, and we in it's a more a little more modern, less Paul, but I, I and I get to do this with my granddaughter. We we just did a little recital together, played a played a song together, and it's just uh, it's it allows us to release the passion that we have that we don't always get to release and make a living. Sometimes you just got to make a living. You got to pay the bills, and you don't always get to do what you want to do when you want to do it. So we love to have these hobbies to fall back on when we come down here. And, and keep our juices flowing. We thought it would be nice to bring you into a finished project. We happen to have a pretty nice project. It's close to home here, just within a few minutes of the shop. So we thought we'd bring you up here and just kind of give you a feel for uh, how we might interact uh, with, a, with a project of a considerable size. Uh, this particular project, in addition, was designed by a local architect. Uh, he did a wonderful job. Uh, maintain the integrity of the building and, and what it is. And, and then they called upon us to uh, tweak the furniture uh, to come up with a design of something that would fit the, the architecture in the building. I'll tell you about how the project went. Uh, a crew came in, took all the pews, and cut all the ends off of them, sent them out. They were a real dark color, and had them stripped and refinished, had new pew ends bought and made and re used the old historical pew ends. The lumber that was out of the middle, we took and we reworked it. And every piece that we did in this church has something, uh, some part, some of them all, some of them just part, but everything has a piece of that old furniture that was preyed on for 100 years in this church before the renovation took place. The, the bulk of what we did here really was to design them an altar podium, tabernacle table, there's a couple stands, uh, there's a new crucifix. We put gothic trims, used some of the old windows that were in the old addition to put in the sanctuary. Uh, we did a, an oils cabinet where we used uh, an electronic motor, had an um, older retired gentleman who got us a, Ed Arnold got us a, a 
door opener out of an automobile, and we converted it to 110, and it runs the glass up and down. And so we did. We, we had some fun with the project. Uh, we did a podium over here. We did, I believe, 13 windows total. Uh, some of them from scratch, and some of them we just replaced old. This large window above the altar, the window frame was completely rotted. We took it apart, restored the glass uh, with a local artisan. He's the one that designed this window over here to match. Uh, the ones down the side and uh, completely new frame, completely new glass and sash. Uh, there's a couple smaller tables and a thing, but uh, the, the, the platform that you're looking at is 100% out of the old pew material that was used in this church for over 100 years. We'd like to thank you for joining us today. It's not easy to show you everything we do. We, we hope we've given you a representative sample of who we are at Greenville Wood Products. If you have a project, we feel that we can handle it for you. Uh, please check us out on the web page at greenvillewoodproducts.com and thank you for joining us today. <laughs>